<laughs> Welcome everyone to the final Performance Art Daily of the ninth edition of the 7A11D <laughs> A International Festival of Performance Art. Um, I'm Johanna Householder. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity, since we often start with thanks, uh, to thank our audiences, the, the, the hearty remnants of the audience that is here today. These are really the hardcore. We don't have anything more pressing in their lives to do on a Sunday than to come and participate in this discussion, and I just think that is completely awesome. Awesome. Um, we have a distinguished uh, roster of people up here to field your um, questions. For some reason, when Paul and I were, were thinking about the various themes, uh, today's was entitled Reflections on Praxis. And of course, when I went around to the various panelists, everybody goes, Praxis? I've always wondered what that word meant. <laughs> what is praxis, etc. So, uh, just to dispense with that, uh, praxis is the melding of theory and practice. Now, to me, actually, it's completely irrelevant for performance because performance is, in fact, praxis. So, uh, I'd like to move on to another PX word, which is proximity. So, let's just dispense with praxis. We all do it, we all appreciate it. You're, sorry? I feel like, where's my dictionary? Where's your dictionary? <laughs> she spent five days worrying about praxis. Praxis? <laughs> oh, what's proximity? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know it. Good point. Good point. Well, yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're all such. Uh, you know, I feel like the four of you really. Uh, are exemplars of praxis, in fact, um, because of the the kind of theoretical propositions you put forth in your work. So I guess I am going to talk about praxis a little bit. Um, uh, I don't know if one can have performance without a theory about performance, obviously, you know, articulated or not. Um, but I think all four of you, in fact, <coughs> in reading your various statements and web presences and so forth, um, foreground the importance of um, your thinking about what it is that you were doing uh, prior to doing it and how it might be effective in the world. <coughs> Sorry. So proximity. Um, I'm going to first introduce our panelists. I don't know if they need to be that. I don't know why I'm calling them panelists. What's another word for this grouping our of people? Guests, artists. guests, artists, our guests, <laughs> our ghosts. Uh, Rachel Eckenberg um, has been making performances since 1992. 20 years, 20th anniversary performance this week. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the anniversary panel. The anniversary panel, yeah. Um, inserts her presence into socially homogenous spaces. Eckenberg highlights the individual as opposed to the societal and creates space in which poetic voice can be heard. Uh, closer to me, Patricia German is uh, <clears throat> based in Berlin. And it is her idea to make genuine and therefore authentic encounters possible in an artificial situation. If that's not theoretical, I don't know what is. Um, Jeff, uh, uh, for 11 years only. Oh, for only 11 years. A baby, a performance art newbie. Come back in nine years, Patricia. <laughs> Um, <laughs> if we don't get hit by a big board. <laughs> Cutting to the chase. 
<laughs> Our skulls are not split by yes. Um, but Jeff, in his uh, uh, work, highlights uh, aspects of collaboratory collaboratory processes that are often effaced: frustration, aggression, and threat. Um, Agnes, I would can only describe as a maxim, maximalist. Um, we asked her for a 100 word uh, artist statement and she sent us uh, 2,500 words <laughs> of a manifesto, which I, unfortunately I was going to read now, but I can't find it. I, it's on my computer. <laughs> so you're just going to have to. But really, she's like, it's theory as long as you're, you know, several computer pages anyway. Um, okay, proximity. Let's start with proximity and audience um, and relationships because uh, you all uh, explored that. I explored that, um, and I guess. Well, gee, I don't know who to start with. Uh, Agnes, I think. Well, you performed first, so yeah, I'll go in chronological order. <clears throat> so you um, captured the audience, um, invited them into a confined space. Did everybody participate in that uh, endeavor? Not everyone. No. Okay. A smoky, uh, smoke-filled, confined space um, where they were eventually um, assaulted with a psychedelic poop, <laughs> <laughs> deliberately or not. So, would you like to talk about those deliberate or undeliberate actions and the proximity of the audience and your relationship to them? Um, because I. I study architecture, so space to me is quite a sensitive element in executing my work, or rather a, a vacuum uh, space. So as soon as I walk into that space, or even from pictures, I already have these preconceived ideas of what I want to do in that space. So even as an architectural project, I will look at a plan and I already know like this has to be there. <laughs> and the people have to have a certain kind of experience when they walk through the space. So I will know uh, this furniture has to be this side or you know, a certain element has to be built. So I think in a way, subconsciously, and uh, the space is constructed, the situation has to be constructed. And well, the intention of um, whether or not the hula would fit into anybody is actually not very intentional. So I, I created a situation where everybody is confined to a space um, and there is no way um, they are able to uh, say, because they didn't know what would happen. So they are being, in a way, uh, lured into a certain um, situation. So as the performance goes on, uh, I just realized that um, they can or cannot, um, either they are being obsessed with what I did with the hula hoop as an imagery uh, spectacle element that they stay or they totally get annoyed because they got hit. So it's really um, lead to any situation that came about during the performance. So there is a bit of um, spontaneity needed between the audience and my action mm -hmm. uh, to determine whether or not they want to leave or they want to stay. So, so I think the intention is to uh, be able to understand how people respond to a certain gesture that is against what they thought initially it is. And during the process, they realize, oh, it's something else. So they can make that choice to leave for the piece. Although you asked them to stay, right? Yeah, I did ask them to stay, which is a constructed <laughs> situation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> did, did you expect them to leave? Yes, because that, that is why the instruction of to give them about the smoke machine, if there's a health issue or they don't feel comfortable, they can leave. question? 
Oh, you're going to get the mic. Okay. We've got mics if people have questions about that. The questions from Agnes? We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but this does actually occur to me, you know, um, Agnes, of course, in her statement, cites Guy Debord's Society as a spectacle. How important is that for us to have read that statement before we enter that space so that we can contextualize? Or, or is it uh, an intuitive process for us, do you think, as audience? I think I'm trying to create a, you know, like, uh, a psychedelic effect, which is quite attractive. So in a city, you know, where you are obsessed with images, signs that tell you where to go, um, that direct every movement of your everyday life. So as you walk into a city, you just unconsciously being derouted or being told what to, where to go, what to do, uh, which direction to take. So things like that is, is quite a constructed system. So for me, I am trying to present that idea of having these very attractive images, images, uh, which is a hula hoop, and basically it go into repetition, and and it kind of starts into people's mind about a certain motion that is always repeating, and it always come back to the same cycle. And no matter where you walk, there are signs that tell you what to do, where to go, and that you know if there is a path in a, a park, it says that it's a linear path. You just walk linearly. You do not you know, walk on the grass or you just don't derude yourself. So I think in Gay Debord, he actually uses this method of the tourment, uh, of uh, using images and languages to um, kind of to break away from uh, this obsessed <coughs> connection with images, or rather the, um, uh, break away from the flow of the obsession. This is drift, so I'm actually using the movement to um, kind of, uh, you know, like let people uh, just not be focusing onto a certain image um, that I created but rather to, as the movement goes, you kind of probably um, not sure if the hula who will fall into them or, you know, like, things that is unexpected is that unexpectation is that. So, so would the I ideal for you be the audience eventually all <coughs> leaving the space and you continuing on? I will if they choose me. Mm. But for me, it's because I want to be in a, uh, I'm kind of creating a situation which is quite controlled. And I'm also doing a gesture that is quite controlled. But losing the sense of control is also something that is losing the kind of concentration to a certain image. So for me, it's um, you're losing a certain concentration and then you're coming back. But every time it reminds you of the same image. So that is a. It can be an intention, but I, I just realized after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, Rachel, your approach is almost, I would say, 180 degrees <laughs> from, from Agnes in terms of that, in terms of your relationship to spectacle, I think. Um, since it seems so much through the kind of lived body and not, it's not, um, although this performance was visually quite beautiful, the visuality is not your primary concern. You no, know, this, this work was a little different. Um, I was made fun of when I showed up with lots of objects. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't, I tend not to use so many things normally. But I don't, I think the, the, the piece wasn't, it wasn't the things that made the piece different, like there was still the, the lived experience or um, proximity and distance is, is a constant in my work, so I'm glad we're talking about proximity now. Um, uh, moving, um, you know, constantly moving the space, um, to be in the space with the other and then this piece moving, you know, 
displacing people. I, I think it has not, it has, I mean, there's two, two ways to talk about it. I guess that the idea of what I, what I did physically and what I did um, uh, spatially. So spatially, just, yeah, um, displacing the people um, and then uh, changing the space, making us very aware of the space, and then constantly moving in, in, in. Hopefully, uh, that it, you you sort of said something at the beginning about the individual and uh, and then the the social, the social. Yeah, I don't. I, I think that it's it's not trying to highlight the individual, but also trying to create an intersubjective kind of space where. Um, the individual isn't only me, but maybe a, some kind of active, empathetic space. Um, so that when, when it becomes more and more and more interior, you're watching me, but you're very, uh, the lived experience is very physical, so that you are also very aware of that feeling internal. So the, the space goes from a very social, um, possibly even political space, to something that goes internal, but it's a shared internal space for Hopefully for me, it's a shared internal space. I don't know if it always succeeds in being there. So that's, I think, how I use proximity <coughs> and distance. And I often use very much phys physically, um, physical closeness and, and distance from others. Um, so so you're, you're depending on a kind of um, empathetic uh, identification, you know, um, I don't think we use this this kind of theory anymore, but the the, the fact that the, or the possibility for for audience participants to actually identify with you and to take on your subjectivity. Yeah, in a, in a physical way and not an emotional way. That's, because I think empathy <coughs> sometimes makes us think of, of emotional empathy, but more like an active, physical, bodily, corporeal empathy. Well, you can't really delink those two, though. Possibly not. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I couldn't in terms of being in the house, you know, smoking a cigarette. It seems to me a very, both both a psychological and uh, yeah, right. and physical space. So that, I don't know if I answered the question, but that that's how I used space in that piece, I think, and that's, and it's a recurring way of using space. How important is it to, um, uh, control the space initially, or and do you do that? Is this is this common in your work? Or, is this good? Do you there's do an this element thing? of con I mean I, I think that there's yeah there's a, a high element of structure, but obviously uh, um, and then I think when I look at my work I realize that there's um, the space I'm trying to control, but I'm also trying to create. Um, an action that can't be controlled, and not, but that the action that can be controlled is more in like what I might do, like uh, in, for instance, smoking in that space. Well, I can't control what you know. I can't control that it's going to what happens to my eyes, or that it you know start crying, not crying, tearing. Um, so there's always that uncontrollable, but then there's also a lot of structure in in spatially formally. Yeah, I'm thinking about clearing the space, right, and creating that space with initially with rolling out the carpet, pushing people to the edges, delineating your space. Seems to me a highly charged political statement, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the politics of space. Something I think um, you're all kind of addressing, actually, in, in that sense. That might lead us to Jeff, actually, since you're nodding. <laughs> Politics of space. I think you know that's uh, <laughs> Which direction do you want me to head in? Spatial politics. Let's well. start with those. With that. <clears throat> uh, well, I. In terms of relationship with audience, uh, I really feel like uh, we're in it together. And the closer that I am to the audience, the, the more likely I'll have of success, whatever that frame, whatever I've sort of decided that framework is for success, what that looks like. Um, because oftentimes, if you're too far away, I don't feel connected. And also, it's not as dangerous or as, I don't even really like the word dangerous, but it's, um, 
it's less uh, physically, like you're less able to connect to what I'm doing. Right. Less threatening. Less threatening. Sorry? Less threatening. Less threatening. Less threatening. I feel like it's more threatening if you're far away than if you're close. Anyway. No. Uh, because it's sort of what I would want. Do we agree with that? No. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what that, if that's the politics of the space. Um, Why don't you like the word danger? Well, I think it gets, I mean, I, it, I don't know, actually. I mean, I, I feel like, I don't, I, I feel like it's one of those words that gets used uh, in performative, in this context, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily, I don't, I guess I, I mean, I feel like if a two by four is coming at you, that's fairly dangerous in a way, but except that you've accepted that space, so it's not, I, I, I don't know, I can't, yeah, it's very, it's, I can't say if I, it just well, doesn't feel right, I mean, I, I, I was talking with somebody um, a, a couple of years ago, and somebody, we were talking about performance artists, and somebody mentioned, you know, like, you know, I was sitting at the table, and we were talking about dangerous performance artists, and they were going through a list, and they included me in it, and I'm like, what are you even talking about? <laughs> like, I don't understand why you would put me in that list. I don't feel dangerous at all. You know, like I'm not harming, I don't feel like I'm harming you or me or <laughs> animals or, you know, there's like nothing, because I don't feel like when we're together in that space that anything bad will happen. You know, because I actually am relying on you to prevent me from being mm -hmm. <laughs> dangerous, really but, dangerous. But I mean, what really happens, dangerous is a totally different situation. Yeah, no, I, I, you're not a survival research lab, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. but on the other hand, what happens then when someone who, you know, I mean, you're aware that there is a, a space of danger around you, the one in, you know, the trajectory of the two by fours, mm -hmm. for instance, <clears throat> and people are responsibly moving out or, you know, carefully, responsibly moving out of the space, out of the harm's way. What happens when somebody enters that space? Then? What's the well, I would, you know, I would hope that somebody would, and it hasn't happened in so long, you know, I mean, I had a, an experience at this performance sound show that, you know, people were actually jumping on my back and pouring beer on my head, you know, during the show. That, I've never been able to get back to. I feel like that's one of the most, that was one of the most, like, successful performances for me, you know, because actually we had physical contact in a sort of strange, dangerous, dangerous space, you know, where we were really there together, you know, we were both there, to, you know, the audience and myself were both there together, and I, I feel like that's really, um, you know, that's incredibly important to that space. And, and also, the, 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 I don't know if I'm answering this, but the, the dangerous aspect is incredibly, I mean, that, that, that it's a little rough is important. Just like that loud sound and the circular, you know, that loud sound in the, in the performance um, earlier last, you know, the two days ago, you know, that loud megaphone mm -hmm. that was circulating around. That's a, that's the violence of that sound was really, really, really important. Mm -hmm. you know? so. Um, so, what you're saying? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. So, okay. um, would you say that it's important for like that engagement with the audience within your piece? Because at one point, I actually basically want to go in the space, but because we're in a gallery setting, I like kind of prevented myself from actually wanting to do that, I guess. I don't know. Like, is that a really important aspect for you, um, that like social interaction within your pieces? Uh, y yes, and, yes and no. You know, I mean, I, I feel like you're completely welcome to come into that space, but once you're in there, I mean, we're rolling around naked on wood. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you want to do that? I, li I like barely want to do that. <laughs> I mean, I, like I really want to do it, but I also don't want to even be, in, you know. So, like, if you're welcome, you're welcome. Not naked, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Not, not very often. I mean, I'm mostly in gallery spaces, you know, talking about spaces. So, and outside is very different. Sorry. Um, so you said someone referred to you as a dangerous performance artist. Uh -huh. 
And do you think that's because of the way people perceive you as a person in the world? Like being um, a cis presenting um, man, and does that affect the way that people interact with you as a performance artist? Do you think it would have been different, as you said, with people pouring a mirror on your head if you presented in the world as a different person, like different body, different gender? Well, I know many um, female artists that are actually dangerous, more dangerous to themselves and to the audience than I am. <laughs> uh, I do, you know, one of the issues, um, you know, surrounding the, well, in the work that I'm doing is about maleness, you know, quality of maleness. Uh, hopefully, a sort of a, Upholding some quality of that while also subverting it to some other in some, in some other way, you know, it's often incredibly embarrassing. Um, but also, it's a really, I think, a really very, um, you know, it's like what do I, that's what I've got. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm very difficult to not have that part of my. I mean, it's me in performance. It's not some other person, you know. So um, I <clears throat> just I feel like I'm talking forever here, but I, uh, <clears throat> you know, like. Um, just in this particular week-long context, I felt very large, and I've tried to get as small as I can. I'm constantly trying to get out of the way and like get smaller and not touch anything and not break anything and not like make any you know sudden moves, you know. And and that's the way I've actually felt from when I got here on Monday <laughs> to the to, to right through my performance. Actually, I mean, I apologized like a million times in my performance for like doing things that I probably shouldn't have been doing, you know. And that's the way. I just was, and I have no idea why, but that that quality went right into the performance, and um, so it became about that, uh, and about you know size. Yes. Uh, you absorb you absorb some Canadianness. Totally. Probably. For saying, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. 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 <laughs> You know, and I was already sorry about the paint even before we even got started. I know. You know? <laughs> Do you have, uh, yeah. to, well, we made you really thing. sorry. Yeah, so I was sorry. <laughs> and, I, and I apologize. I fully expected, I fully so expected you to, to apologize at the end of the entire I'm sorry. Well, I apologize like, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll think about forgiving you. Yeah. It's not forgivable. Yeah. Unforgivable. Um, Patricia, are you sorry for uh, <coughs> assaulting us with those pheromones? <coughs> it smelled like, to me, like feet. You're not Canadian. <laughs> the Germans are not sorry. Uh, no, 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 if you're not sorry about them, what are you about them? What's their, what's their uh, a, a psychological quality for you? Um, is this working? Yeah, 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 you're good. Well, I feel a little bit strange to talk so much about art because I think as an artist my job is to kind of wrap up my work in a way it will speak for, for, for itself. Mm -hmm. So I just did it and I would like to, I don't know, rather um, hear what you guys think than to explain it even more. Um, so I cannot really respond to this question yeah, because I, I think it's it's all out there to those who, who saw it. And um, maybe you can ask me something else or you can say, say something. I guess as a response to that, I felt like you were like a social experiment in a way. And like how you had everyone kind of writing down um, like 
how like we're engaging with you. So I felt like I was an experiment, and it did feel a little bit um, like watchful. That was my sense of it. I mean, like what? Huh? You felt like what? Um, like we're constantly being kind of watched, or we, uh, we as a subject instead of you as a subject. So like you're kind of putting that on the audience in a way. But in my experience, at least of the piece, if that's what you're asking for, like how we felt as the audience, or how I felt as a participant in your piece. Um, uh, you don't have to um, punch that out of it. You try to say. Yeah. Is it an experiment for you? Um, well, it's an art piece. Um, it's laid down under um, testing arrangement conditions. It has, you know, it looks like an experiment, of mm -hmm. course, um, but I think it's, yeah, it, it's much more than an experiment. I see it as an, as an artwork. How did you, um, how did you get to the, the use of pheromone? pheromones, like what preceded that and then you had the idea for the pheromones? Um, well, um, I made so many performances um, in which I was involving the audience as, um, as participants, you know, and I, um, it kind of turned out to be always a role play where I lay down the role of the audience and myself because I was kind of always analyzing what performance was or what art was, like laying down the cornerstones of it. Um, I w I'm sorry my English is not so good because I, I would like to speak more precisely, but I will just try it anyway. Um, I was always wondering about this situation, you know, I'm there and people are there and that's the performance and I'm doing something and people are watching me and that's a performance and if I have expectations I have to uh, fulfill them or even not fulfill them but um, well like that's it and I uh, started out as an artist who never saw a performance before I started doing them so I just knew performances out of books from the 70s because we didn't have that in my art school and we didn't have that so much, it was not so much in fashion actually in, um, when I started out. So I kind of always was wondering like what's the recipe for a performance. And um, I was kind of analyzing that all the time. So I developed this thing where I was always involved in the audience and it was based on, okay, it, it's all on you, like what you Give is what you get. It's not happening without you. Um, in my um, first years, it was very physical. So um, it was very much about physical contact, but with, um, body was always a bridge for something else because it was very, you know, um, about how you feel and how you think about emotional. So. Um, when people were writing about myself and saying I was using my body as, um, as my material, I just felt it's so much not true. I just have this body, that's how I manifest myself in the world, I'm using this. Um, and then I just went a step further, you know, I wanted to, to be not about uh, physical um, interaction, I, wanted, um, I just realized um, I kind of... Um, became a performance personality in um, the artist circle where I was and it was so much based on my presence. I just realized, okay, I have such a strong presence as a person, I don't need to put so much action into that. So I just wanted to, to see how, how I can make it much more about um, what's in your mind anyway. You know, I started getting those um, stories um, told about people who heard about the performance, they didn't see it even, but they heard it like a second-hand experience or even a third-hand experience. And people was, were telling, uh, talking to me like they had seen a movie. It was so full of life and full of emotions. I was really kind of trying to, um, yeah, to capture that in my new, in, 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 yeah, in the next level. I feel like that's like, like that's the next level for myself, you know. Um, working on things which are 
basically in your head and in your um, anticipation and in your um, yeah and um, it's actually actually when I when I think of the image of your performance uh, it seems in fact quite playful mm -hmm. it's not so serious it's not so heavy uh, and, um, you're sitting there bathing in pheromones and you have this little pussycat smile on your face, actually. Um, that was quite, uh, you know, it's quite charming and you look like you're kind of having a little ball, ball next, sitting next to you. Uh, so in a, in a sense, I, I, you know, I think, and maybe if we've all so the praxis were kind of drifted into a bit overly serious mode, but it seems to me there's also quite a bit of play in that. Oh yes, it's a lot of play in my work. It's always uh, has been, and, and it has a lot of humor actually, and mm -hmm. it has a lot of um, a light feel to it, but um, sometimes it touches very deep uh, things or the deep levels. I actually like that, how it, uh, it's wrapped up in a, in a light mode. But you know, you just walk in in a, in a certain moment. I think I went through all those uh, different kinds of moods yesterday. So maybe someone else has seen something else. Yeah. <laughs> what did you see, Sylvie? Uh, seriousness. 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 Were there, were there other people sitting in the uh, scenario? Not, not at that moment. She was alone. Yeah, well, I was there. You sat, did you sit down? <laughs> What? Did you sit down? Yes, yes, I did sit down next to her. I, I first uh, read the text and then tried to read what what was uh, written in the books. I, I should have it. And no, I think it was very interesting. Uh, did actually, you, sorry, go ahead. Actually, I like that that you uh, kind of always miss something, you know, because that's how how art is sometimes or how life is. You turn around and you just don't get something. So someone else might might get it, or maybe it's, sometimes I went also around with the people taking minutes. It was amazing uh, because no one except them witnessed what was happening. Um, so actually, I liked that a lot. Uh, humor, funny, Jeff. <laughs> Light-hearted. Hilarity, hilarity um, is important for you. It has been recently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in fact, actually, the last few the last few performances have been more like let's see what happens in that space a little bit. And, and um, I had a performance in Chicago uh, a few weeks ago, and I just basically it was similar to this performance. Actually, the actions were. Um, goal, you know, geared towards doing the same similar um, activity, and like I just started walking. I just walked across the floor, and people were cracking up in the audience. And I'm like, uh, I'm just walking across the room. <laughs> Is that where the title for this came from? Yes, basically. You know, and I couldn't figure. I just couldn't figure it out. But I was like, okay, well, that's fine. Let's just go with it. And whatever I did. Take my pants off, ha ha. Put my pants on, ha ha. You know, <laughs> you know. And so we're just like, I, I'm like, I don't even know how. Okay, like, so finally, I'm like, fine. Well, that's just the way this particular rainbow is going to get up out of the air. Is everybody's got to be like, it's funny, you know. And and I really, I love that. Actually, it was terrific. You know, uh, totally different than the one that came before it. And um, so, you know, it's one of those like pouring, you know, jumping on my back and pouring beer over my head. It's like an opportunity. Like, I really like that. So let's see what we can do. And and I tried some things in this version that I think more or less don't work. But you know, there were like doors that I feel like I had to open to see what happens in there. Um, and the only way to really, <laughs> the only way to find out is to get in there and, and do it. So, um, and I had this, uh, you know, I really wanted like the last performance that I just recently did. I'm like, what's happening down there? Why is that going? Why does it? Why is my penis going away? Like, what's the story? You know, and so like I had this whole like in my mind. I just said that out loud, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I had this whole conversation with it, and I'm like, okay, well, let's see if we can have a conversation with it in front of people. And why would I do that? 
and call attention to this in any way. So it's okay. and also, you know, one of the one of the one of the doors is is embarrassed is a little is being embarrassed. Um, you know, so you have to open that door and then you have to open that door and see. And many most actually many of the doors I felt personally many of the doors that I opened weren't there were, the rooms were empty. <coughs> So, it seems like your embarrassment door was full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, maybe. maybe. So, what, are you, what are you looking for on the other side of that door? Right, exactly. What am I looking for on the other side of that door? Um, I think a new experience. A new, a new experience, a new relationship with the material, a new relationship with the audience, a new relationship with myself. Um, something, you know, not uh, new and inter in interesting, actually. Not, it doesn't even have to be new, it just has to be um, engaging. You know, like how, 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 um, how do I, how, here's, a, here's, a new, here's an opportunity to have some new, like really new experience, some fresh experience, and, uh, and um, use and try to find a way to use that new experience as a trigger that will um, allow the, 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 the goal to um, fulfill itself. But um, that's interesting because you were constantly actually reminding us that this was a cliche, right? Right. At the same at the right. time you're talking about time. newness. Right. Yes. <laughs> Which is a strategy as well. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted to try to call attention to that quality of performance that I, you know, Try to, I, and, and one of the strategies was to try to remove myself from the performance and get back in and get back out and get back in and get back out and get back in and get back out mm -hmm. and see if I could manage that space and what would happen if I was in both keeping you know one foot on one side and one foot on the other all the time and then would it be possible if I could stand with you and stand with me could we both get this thing up in the air you know so that was a specific if I had a if I had a plan <laughs> at the beginning that would have been a plan, you know, is to try that out. What if we've chosen the hand? Well, I wish you had, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard this too. <laughs> um, well, the options were good, and there was a lot of, you know, it's sort of like teleporting yourself to performance land. Wow. <laughs> Let's all try that later. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, I feel like it's yet. not working. <laughs> I have a comment. Yeah, sorry. Okay, and then Rachel. Um, so I, it, going back to your comment about being an investigation into maleness, um, what I find interesting about thinking about it in, from the, in retrospect, is there you are, you're this big guy, you're tall, and you're doing this really hard thing. You're trying to lift this unwieldy, Clunk, chunk of wood that's painted like a silly rainbow. So I mean, there was this nice. I mean, I think it was for me less humor and more vulnerability, kind of like silliness and that other side of maleness that a lot of males don't show in performance. For example, you weren't wearing black and you weren't. You didn't have a very kind of a lot of machismo wasn't showing and you know your your real vulnerable side was showing. And so I think that in a way, added to the the danger element of trying to, I mean, that, that was a very hard thing to do, mm. but but it, it was also, didn't seem as hard, I mean, it did seem hard, but it didn't seem as hard, deliberately hard. Mm -hmm. So I, I like that juxtaposition of the very colorfulness, the, the way the paint didn't kind of work, and. And then we had to pick up the yellow paint off. But you know, I mean, I kind of liked that it was sort of childlike and that you didn't. You had a lot of performance cliches there, but you also subverted some of those cliches. That's more articulate. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no. no, you're pretty funny, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, you're funny. I'm really funny. <laughs> but. Yeah, but only you might laugh later. <laughs> you don't need to, you don't usually laugh uh, during. I guess I, like, when is you had, oh, we were talking after this last night, and you were talking about that getting you to a state. And when you said it now, I'm thinking about 
all of these performances, and they were all very uh, individual centered. I mean, even um, even Patricia, where we're we're still. I mean, she is the center of this. It's about her and the smell she's giving off. Agnes is filling the space. Your alcohol was whether it's for you or not. It was yeah. it was space. invasive in a in a very. Um, very like very physical reactive way for the audience so whether it got you there or not it took us into a completely different place where it's like oh he's pouring water on his head oh shit it's not excuse me it's not water it's um it's burning my eyes just by the fumes so you know we're aware of your body but also uh, you, you know in there i don't i don't i didn't in this case use a reactive substance but it's it's, it's just interesting i i guess i'm just thinking of like if that's something anybody else wants to talk about, but just like when a space becomes invaded by some kind of reactive substance. Well, you can't get much more proximus, proximate than yeah. up, up somebody's nose. Yeah. Um, which or, you all yeah. did, actually. This mm -hmm. is the, you know, I mean, Rachel <laughs> had a sticky got up her nose. <laughs> yeah. I always, I was talking about this, Mar uh, Margaret, with your, your, what you categorized in the live book the rappers and the rapper-uppers and the stinkers, and the, I don't know who else was in that list. Who else was in that list? I can't remember, It was your list. It was It was in our interview. Julie, go outside. Okay, well that, that'll be the last 15 minutes. Margaret and I will like rest. I know, she's got her arthritis in her hips. She's going down. Okay, stickers. I'm wanting to get up people's noses. I mean, I, we, I already asked you how, how you came to pheromones, but how did you come to the smoke then? I mean, fog. I always have this uh, feeling that is kind of confused. <laughs> <laughs> so like, the fog you know, is kind the, of literally a fog. Yeah, literally, but in your face and it presents. So I just feel like everybody is kind of, you know, generally people are kind of confused. And, uh, you know, they, <laughs> they choose between choices and they are vulnerable, but they sometimes don't show it and I'm vulnerable and I show it in my performance. I feel that sometimes vulnerability for me is more real than not doing performance. You know, not during the period when I'm not doing performance. I feel more real when I do performance. Because it allows me to be vulnerable and allow me to you know just just use my subconsciousness in another way. So I feel uh, okay uh, the smoke machine is basically to present the obvious. For me, the fog means you know you kind of be misty about things and you're kind of confused about choices to make every day. There's different roles to play, and it's an environment that is present. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's interesting to be able to. Um, uh, for me, I would like everybody to be able to be clear in that confused environment. Like, you know, you try to <laughs> you try to find yourself in that kind of situation. And I think um, I'm always trying to confuse myself sometimes in order to, you know, make the right choice. Mm. Or I'm not sure whether it's going to be the right choice, but eventually there are situation layouts you make mistakes, um, confuse your mind a little bit, and then you kind of even it out um, after the confused state. Mm -hmm. It's a similar strategy with Jeff, it seems to me, this idea of confusing yourself in order to mm, force yourself to make a decision. In the performance. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, you have to go in the round. I mean, I always find I have to go in around the back, or the side, or like up underneath. I can't go right straight in. Um. Rachel, 
Are you confused? Yeah. <laughs> I am confused because I, I, I think you can't talk about um, physical matter that's like physically affecting people and talk about it like it's a, a emotion. I mean, maybe that's practice. I don't know, but like, like you know, fog isn't just. It's not just that we're feeling foggy. It's it's foggy. It's 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 hard to breathe. It's you know. It's I don't know. I don't. I don't think I have anything to say. About it. I just. I, I'm just. I'm. I find it interesting actually how different we can think about um, a substance or how we can um, take over a space or something. I, I'm. I'm gonna stop there. I don't know exactly where I'm going. But it's just. I'm, it's just a thought. Like it's interesting for me using using. I think I, I worked with. Um, re like trying to create physical reactions a lot. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I don't have a train of thought here, I'm just going to go on But have you worked with physical reactions in your work? Uh, laughter, I know, but... Yeah, like how to get my, my body or the body of my audience into a different state, yeah. Like, laugh, all kinds of different physical reactions. Crying, um, uh, laughter, uh, urinating, anything that, like, I can't control. You're getting the audience urinating? <laughs> that, uh, that would be good. <laughs> that would be good. Uh, uh, Turn the uh, tables yeah, on those are performance. Like, how, does one, how does one get their body to abandon? And it's a very physical thing, like to abandon something, to allow something to happen. I think that's what Patricia also is touching on, physically affecting our states. I I I, I, mean, I I don't really know what I'm talking. I'm talking of, like I'm not talking towards something. So I'll just mm -hmm. stop no, right it, there. well, we're going to turn yeah. you around. Yeah, yeah. stop. Basil. Do something. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Um, something you touched on earlier, the, the spatial politics. Something to kind of go back to, and mm -hmm. specifically the four artists, that how they almost thought of the idea of negotiating the space with people, audience, or not. Um, when, for example, Rachel rolled down her carpet, she didn't negotiate with everyone, she took over. As opposed to Jeff, who was having this play with the audience, and uh, until they kind of almost fled to the other room, to the other uh, part of the room. I don't know, maybe you can say something about this, if you thought of, are you negotiating with the audience about this place, or not, or it just happened um, because of the context of the work? Uh, I guess I feel like it's less of a negotiation. I mean, you nego we negotiated when you came in, and I came in. <laughs> I mean, we're already, you're already there. Mm -hmm. Like, that negotiation is over. Uh, and then from that point on, you just ex you ex <laughs> you know you either accept. I mean, I I mean it, <laughs> in this in my in this particular situation, I tried to go as low as possible so that the so that there was a situation in which it was going to feel like the paint was going to get on you or the beer was going to spill or the, that I was rolling towards you with the lumber that you had some time to figure out what you were going to do. You know, like I didn't really do a lot of like really big like <laughs> throwing movements because I knew that the space was fairly small and there were a lot of people in there and I really don't want to hurt you necessarily, but I feel like you have to have some time to... So I guess, in, I mean, so now that I think about it, I guess in a way, if you use the word negotiation, we're, it's a constant. That, so then once you come in and we're all together, then we have to continuously reinvent the, the space where the performing happens. Just actually out of practicality, you know, there's not a lot of, there wasn't a lot of room in there, you know, and um, uh, whereas, you know, um, you can and have to assert yourself in a way <laughs> to have space to work. I mean, literally the night um, you, you performed, I, I was like, I was jammed up against the wall. Okay, they want to know where, where it's going and how, and, and how it will unfold, because obviously there's some kind of structure. Um, but it's interesting you say non-negotiating and somebody else was talking about like, uh, what if you were in a different body? Well, like, two very different bodies, right? Like, so, 
maybe I need to try <laughs> trying to take more states or something, yeah. and maybe you're not. Well, but, but I think it's it. also a matter of actually physicalizing those politics. It, not only yourself, it's not only we who embody practice, it's the practice as artists, but it's, the, it's everybody. Yeah. Everybody. So it's phys physicalizing those, the politics of the space by using the audiences, you know, or not using them, but they're experiencing it as much as, you know. I'm well, saying, I'm saying about it. Like we're not on a stage, say. we're not on a stage, so you do negotiate that when you come in. Like Jeff said, you negotiate it when you walk in the door. You know that, you know, you don't know where you're supposed to be. Right. Yeah. You have a choice. Well, I think yes and no, because yeah. um, people didn't know that they would be pushed aside or they had to flood the room. I mean, like, if you're, you're prepared for something to happen, but you're not prepared to be squished against the wall. And I mean, I mean, I think it's really, really interesting because it's such an analogy for so many other things, but it was kind of like, I didn't know that something's going to be rolled and I'm going to have to go like this and someone's going to be squishing me. Um, and that's a choice maybe on your behalf to kind of choose to be in the middle of the room or actually go in the corner of the room and people will be comfortably standing on the other side of the room. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess because I didn't want people necessarily to be comfortable, yeah. I wanted to displace you with my grand, yeah, so my grand land, and then, right, you know, right. it was all about displacing you, so mm -hmm. you shouldn't be so comfortable. Um, but, but you also <laughs> knew when you, I mean, just the act of coming to a performance art. <laughs> your, your, your expectations are that you may, you may not be comfortable at some point. Yeah. You know, like, and in a weird way, you have to, in a way, you have to be comfortable with that discomfort to actually come, right? Or right. yeah. to stay. But you have to be looking for that. A yeah. yeah, yeah. And then a weird way, I was thinking with the, um, what you were saying about the kind of boundaries and that. This place, but that it's not like kind of state boundary, that boundary is shifting, but like we all know that it's going to shift. We don't just like freak out because the like the stage area is suddenly moving. You're like, okay, yeah, so we're going to move out the way. Well, she's not moving, so we're definitely going to move out the way. Or, you know, I think it's not so clear cut as, as we might like to think sometimes. I think also there's a big difference between comfort and safety. And I'm prepared to be uncomfortable, I'm prepared to be challenged, I'm not prepared to have a two by four swing inches from my head. And like there was not time for negotiation in a lot of moments of your performance. Um, and I felt very unsafe. Like I felt comfortable sitting on the floor holding a balloon, that was fine. Like, but um, some people didn't. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but that, but I didn't feel threatened. And then in, in a lot of ways, there are a lot of moments that felt like, um, this is a cheesy pop culture reference, but no country for old men, where you're standing there and you're asking us to make a choice that, at, like, I just wanted to scream out, neither, like right. none of these options are like safe. Right. Like Life's not in a like comfort safe, but it felt very dangerous and it felt very manipulative in a lot of ways. And there wasn't time for negotiation. And I, I don't really have anything else to say other than that, but yeah. there is a difference between comfort and safety, like physical safety. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I agree, and I think, uh, um, and I agree that the choice was very manipulative, um, which I guess I, I accept uh, in that situation. Um, not hurting, you know. I'm, you know. I mean, you're. We talked about culpability the other day, and I, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's just. I mean, that's it. I need to understand that word in a way that in performance. So let's try it. You know, normally I would never make you make that choice, except that you came. You know, that was the choice you made, and I would never have made you make that choice. <laughs> like, why would I? Why? Why do I even want you to make that choice in the first place? With, what, what is that for me? Mm -hmm. you know? That's a good question. Right, answer exactly. That. You know, and it's why yeah, answer I, that question <laughs> <laughs> that you just posed for yourself. It's a really good one. Um, well, there's an effort here to in, to uh, to pull you in to my world <laughs> because that's where you are. <laughs> you know, you've come to that space. That's it's me now. It's like la 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 da da da. You know, Jeff world. Da, da, da. 
and so you so now we're there and I need to get you there because if you don't come there with me it's fine but I'd rather you did for a little while because that's going to really help me get that thing up in the air I don't know why I can't actually really tell you why right now uh, I still don't know why after six whatever stupid versions of this thing I can't tell you why you need to be there holding the balloon ready the thing but going up I can't tell you why that's happening uh, but I need you to be there anyway so that's that the choice and the, so that skips aside the choice which I haven't really been able to decide yet. Um, the safety version of the, of the two by four is coming at you I apologize for it's a, <laughs> it's a small space. I wasn't expecting that. Of course, that's fine with me because I'm looking for things that I don't expect. Uh, I do think that as a person in the world, and there's some construction going on, you don't normally just like walk right into the hard hat area. You know? And I've invited you into the hard hat area without a hard hat, which I'm also in without a hard hat. Construction site without a barrier. Without a barrier. Uh, so you are you. I expect that you'll have some intelligence and some and some protective element of your own. <laughs> so you'll you'll make the right choice. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And if you don't make the right choice, which we don't always make the right choice, then there are repercussions for that. You know, and I certainly exhibited many wrong choices. In my well, life. I made it through also. Yeah, right. And you know, like a two by four hitting is not such a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's not. I mean, it happens all the time. Things fall on me all the time. It's not. You know. it's I, the work, the work that I do is painful. I, the work I do, like in order to do the thing that I have to do, is painful. And my own life outside of performance. So, Jeff, I, I was really interested in seeing you perform in a Canadian context, especially with this "I'm sorry" bit, because I, I too felt manipulated. Like I felt like I was manipulated into cheering for you and yes, showing your masculinity and. Yeah. Which I was like, oh yeah, I'm really enjoying it too. But I also enjoyed really smelling you as well. So um, I felt really manipulated there as well. Um, but then in terms of Canada, thinking about this whole like apology thing and how um, you know we can say a lot of stories, but but then things keep go ahead going ahead anyway, right? Anyway, that was something I was thinking about you as like a Canadian who's been in the states and then looking at your work there and thinking about it and then being here. Is he un more un he's unapologetic in the States? Well, why well, this is my first time actually seeing oh, okay. yeah. Are you Are you more unapologetic oh, when you perform in the States? I never apologize like that before. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> 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 that honestly means that actually. It might have been the pheromones. It might have been the pheromones. I actually have a question. Paul, yes. Um, Everybody's talking to some extent about negotiation, and, 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 and I, I think there, that's a little naive, or at least needs another level of thought in relation to it, because for sure, when an audience comes to a performance and they know it's performance art, they're making a choice, and they understand, they may be uncomfortable, they may understand, perhaps to some extent they may be manipulated, but I don't think they understand that they're in negotiation. I think an artist has to set up conditions that teach the audience that. Because my experience is that audiences don't think they're really negotiating anything and don't really feel they have the agency to negotiate anything. And I, as an audience member, who's gone to performance for 25 years, also doesn't necessarily feel any freedom of negotiation unless the conditions have been set up that I feel offer that to me. I, I really think it has to be signaled in, in some very, well, I'm always thinking about what the strategies and tactics for that are, but I, I'd be curious about your comments around that because I don't think audiences do think they expect them to, to, to be in negotiation. You have to flee. That, that makes, me, uh, makes me think because I thought that was really interesting. <coughs> I missed this piece how um, you set up this, this situation where we could be, we were really aware of where we could be. You this amount of space, and then when people started getting hit with the hula hoop, I mean, it was kind of scary. Like it was like, okay, it's gonna come up. When people started getting hit with the hula hoop, it gave it back to her. Yeah. You know, it's like if they didn't want to be hit by the hula hoop, it was like, oh, okay, so, oh, so, you know, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I got hit. She wasn't saying sorry. Like gave it back to her, and she would start again. And that to me became so interesting about. I mean, 
if people, if you don't want to be there, yeah, I, I think we think of, we, we are still audience and we do think that way. I don't know how, unless, you know, you make, a, I mean, I guess it's so clear about where, where you should be, but it's still very tight and it's foggy and it's like that something could happen and did, but I guess also people say, well, it didn't really hurt. Actually, actually, it makes me think about performance because I used to research on the panopticon, the structure of panopticon. Basically, they have uh, uh, all the prisoners are in total darkness, so they are being made to control their movement. So, in a way, I feel that I'm not telling the audience to negotiate in that space, and I'm also not limiting them. But you know, in the mind, people limit themselves. Yeah. I, I Veronica and then Sam. Um, I just want to say, like, it's like performance in general, or like as a form of art within the gallery space. There's already like connotations to the gallery space as it is, right? We're so, or people are used to looking at a piece without having that um, physical connection per se to it. Like, you don't, you know, you're not necessarily thinking that the paint's gonna jump out at you. Like, the paint's gonna jump out, jump out at you. But the performance. Um, you're seeing the artist kind of like go through this process and you're actually it's part of the space and you're part of the piece which people don't really think about um, so I think that's really interesting how we're talking about uh, the relation or like the proximity of us within the space and like our consent within the gallery like we're not really um, what's it called like I mean we're not expected to write a waiver form or something but it, um, it's a physical consent, consultation of like you being in that space. Like we're always constantly kind of negotiating within our spaces, whether if we're at home, or if we're in um, a work institution or a, a school institution too. So, I guess that's what I just wanted to say. Okay, uh, well, we have we're approaching two o'clock, so we've got one, and then Basia, you can have the last question. Uh, is Sandy, sorry. sorry. Um, I was just going to say that uh, I think this harks back a little bit to what we were talking about yesterday in the panel about um, the sort of institutionalization of performance, and I think that sort of my my sense of his, of the historics of performance of like happenings and fluxes and things was there was a little bit more uh, blurring of boundaries between the performer and the audience as sort of you know colluders in what was in the occurrence. Um, or simply that, in the case of Fluxus, in a very public environment um, in which there, there was no, no um, fourth wall or concept of, of that. Um, and I think that, to a certain extent, what, what I'm seeing more um, is this, in inter this institutionalization of performance that's moving more towards the rules of theater, where, uh, where audiences are feeling much more passive and much more like, Oh, they're supposed to be good little doobies and watch the the tableau, and then then they can think about it and write about it and be polite. But that there's there is more and more of that creeping into the world of performance, which personally I don't think is a very good thing. Um, but I think also in terms of Jeff's work, obviously I'm his wife, so I've seen a lot of it, and I've seen him perform in in a lot of different venues in different countries and in different places, and um, and this notion of of a warning being given um, is something that I think uh, I was talking with him because he was sort of feeling so fearful about this performance, about this environment. There was a lot of talk ahead of time about not splashing any paint on the wall and not doing the stuff on the floor. And all of this stuff was making him feel more and more like he shouldn't really move or shouldn't really do the things that he's supposed to do. And um, and he said, oh, I think I got wood that's too big. And I, and I said, no, just, you know, this seems so unlike him. I said, well, just do it because my, my perception of the way that Jeff creates a creates an environment in which that can happen, in which the audience knows right from the beginning that they need to take responsibility for themselves in a big way, in terms of their own personal safety. And he's always very good at that because of his his attitude and his physical gestures are so la so large and so violent, even in starting starting the work and putting down the pails and doing all of this stuff, that there is a, a very, I think, a very clear message from the beginning that always seems to work very well with the audience, that they know right from the beginning, okay, I'm gonna keep my eyes open and I'm gonna back up and I'm gonna move around wherever I need to move, and that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested to see it. it this partly, 
this full realization came to me when I was in Chicago also doing a piece there because I, I very seldom do anything that hurts the audience and I would I, I sort of explain everything and I talk and I tell them what I want them to do and where I want them to stand and all this stuff. And there was a part in this piece where I, I took this, I had this egg beater and I threw it out to the audience and I was going like this to show them that I was going to throw it to them so that somebody should catch it, right? So I just threw it and people were like this, you know, and it, it hit somebody because everybody went like this instead of catching the thing, even though I had signaled that I was throwing it. And I realized that that because of the environment that I create in my pieces where everybody's going to be safe all the time, then people just sort of are incredibly passive, you know, and in Jeff's case that's not usually the case, and yet I think that he shrank in this case to make himself smaller and was apologizing a lot, and he, he sort of didn't create the usual kind of performance space that he creates by his initial actions um, in this particular case as much, and I think that I was interested to see, I was, I couldn't quite understand that. It's like, why are they still standing there when they see that these things are moving back and forth and he's having a hard time carrying them? Why, why are they still standing there, you know? And they didn't move, you know, until actually some stuff came down over onto people's heads. And even then, I didn't see a lot of hands go up to move the, to move the things. It was more just like this, you know? Well, that's not a way that you're gonna save a, a two by four from hitting you, is just to go like this. Huh? People were holding balloons. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, protecting you know, the balloons. <laughs> <laughs> I was just really, I was very interested. So, so anyway, that's just yeah. two sentences. Can you pass the mic to Valencia? I'm holding my mic. Yes, this is mine. Do you think I need a microphone? Or yes, you have to be on the table. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say that there is something very, very beautiful in the whole conversation that goes as a thread and appears in all of your uh, sometimes explicit uh, uh, meanings, sometimes just inklings, and I think it has much to do with the uh, nature of the contractual, nature of the contract in performance art. And I think if someone wants to make this great effort and do a theoretical research, they can certainly end up with the apology of the contractual in performance art. And um, just because of Rachel uh, and, and the question that was asked about, about her carpeting, uh, I think, can you hear? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I think the suggestion, I think the contract was held in a very subtle way, relying on the logic of the action itself. Because, why, why relying on the logic? And why logic of the action? Because there is a tacit agreement that once we attend the performance, we would follow the intentionality of the artist and the logic of the action and we would be answerable to it, we would be responsive to it. Mm -hmm. So the inductive logic we have with experiences like rolling out the carpet is that it expands and it takes space. So there is a very subtle suggestion that relies on this tacit agreement that once I'm inside this action, you would respond to it and you would become part of it through moving away and letting the thing go and feel the space. So I think that's one type of, of making contract, which is not certainly doesn't rely on any verbal negotiations. Uh, there are the moments when he, the performance artists play with, with this moment of negotiating and, and Jeff did in a, again in a very subtle way. Then there are other moments when, again, the risk was conveyed through the logic of what he was doing. In, in what? If you see a guy walking this way outside in the street, of course you pull up, you, know, you, you stay away and look at him and you might go and say, what are you doing? You know, is it, is it, you know, is it okay? Is it safe? So you can decide to negotiate or you might decide not to. But I'm saying that there is also a level of normative conformity that Sandy talked about in the gallery that, of course, it's very problematic if we start thinking of. But um, again, thank you for bringing all together this question which is very important, we should start thinking of more and more and more. And what is the, the kind of agreement we can agree upon? And what, what's really uh, healthy for us, but at the same time keeps the whole dynamic and the whole potential of the performance art and not turning into a kind of cosmetic art gallery, uh, Ikebana, I don't know how, how we call it. So thank you. Ikebana, yeah. Yes, um, I, uh, I know. I think we have to wrap up. Oh, yes. I have a comment. You have a comment. I have time to Well, no, I, I know this was already said, but I really think it's interesting thinking about the cultural specificity 
of, of being in Toronto and of this place and doing the performances in these galleries and how amazing it is to have these international artists come here and bring us their work, but also what we as an audience then bring to them and the challenges and the questions that it brings to you all because like I can't think it came up for Patricia too and Patricia was asking in advance like, oh, but what if people start bringing chairs and sitting down and doing this and that? And I was like, I don't think people are gonna do that here. You know what I mean? And like, but, but also all of it, or like, will people move on the way when you come with a big piece of wood? Like maybe a little bit, maybe not so much because we're just kind of like, how we roll, and, and even it was interesting for me last night when Irene came and sat down, we were actually planning to start like 15 minutes after that, but as soon as she entered the space, everyone's like hushed and quiet, it's like, oh, 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 something's happening, we're all quieting down, and, and whether the bar is open during the performances or not, you know, it's just kind of like very interesting, I think, for, for you all to bring your work, work here and kind of be in, in our space and in our audience here, and just kind of, and not to say that it's, uh, homogenous in terms of like what you know what a Toronto audience looks like because it's not um, um, and, and we have like you know a, so much diversity here in terms of how individuals kind of what what we all bring to to the performances as an audience but but it is really interesting I think um, in thinking about that the cultural context of, of coming here to Toronto. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I totally agree. I think that that uh, performance, I've always said performance art is, audiences are the hardest working audiences in show business. Um, uh, and, I, and, and I, tying that to what Vasya was talking about, the logic of the intention of the action of the, and the logic of the material uh, and how hard these are these our the audiences of the last five days have worked to fulfill those intentions and to pursue those logics with you and I think it's been a really wonderful experience and that's not over and it's not over um, we're about to fulfill the intentions of Camille Turner uh, I hope uh, so we're gonna have a short break uh, uh, a